Roughing It by Mark Twain, Chapter 25 Originally, Nevada was a part of Utah and was called Carson County, and a pretty large county it was, too. Certain of its valleys produced no end of hay, and this attracted small colonies of Mormon stock raisers and farmers to them. A few Orthodox Americans straggled in from California, but no love was lost between the two classes of colonists. There was little or no friendly intercourse. Each party stayed to itself. The Mormons were largely in the majority and had the additional advantage of being peculiarly under the protection of the Mormon government of the territory. Therefore, they could afford to be distant and even peremptory toward their neighbors. One of the traditions of Carson Valley illustrates the condition of things that prevailed at the time I speak of. The hired girl of one of the American families was Irish and a Catholic, yet it was noted with surprise that she was the only person outside of the Mormon ring who could get favors from the Mormons. She asked kindnesses of them often and always got them. It was a mystery to everybody. But one day, as she was passing out at the door, a large bowie knife dropped from under her apron, and when her mistress asked for an explanation, she observed that she was going out to borrow a wash tub from the Mormons. In 1858, silver loads were discovered in Carson County, and then the aspect of things changed. Californians began to flock in, and the American element was soon in the majority. Allegiance to Brigham Young and Utah was renounced, and a temporary territorial government for Washoe was instituted by the citizens. Governor Roop was the first and only chief magistrate of it. In due course of time, Congress passed a bill to organize Nevada Territory, and President Lincoln sent out Governor Nye to supplant Roop. At this time, the population of the territory was about twelve or 15,000 and rapidly increasing. Silver mines were being vigorously developed and silver mills erected. Business of all kinds was active and prosperous and growing more so day by day. The people were glad to have a legitimately constituted government, but did not particularly enjoy having strangers from distant states put in authority over them, a sentiment that was natural enough. They thought the officials should have been chosen from among themselves, from among prominent citizens who had earned a right to such promotion, and who would be in sympathy with the populace and likewise thoroughly acquainted with the needs of the territory. They were right in viewing the matter thus, without doubt. The new officers were emigrants, and that was no title to anybody's affection or admiration either. The new government was received with considerable coolness. It was not only a foreign intruder, but a poor one. It was not even worth plucking, except by the smallest of small fry office seekers and such. Everybody knew that Congress had appropriated only $20,000 a year in greenbacks for its support, about money enough to run a court's mill a month. And everybody knew, also, that the first year's money was still in Washington, and that the getting hold of it would be a tedious and difficult process. Carson City was too wary and too wise to open up a credit account with the imported bantling with anything like indecent haste. There is something solemnly funny about the struggles of a newborn territorial government to get a start in this world. Ours had a trying time of it. 
The Organic Act and the instructions from the State Department commanded that a legislature should be elected at such and such a time, and its sittings inaugurated at such and such a date. It was easy to get legislators, even at $3 a day, although board was $4.50. For distinction has its charm in Nevada as well as elsewhere, and there were plenty of patriotic souls out of employment. But to get a legislative hall for them to meet in was another matter altogether. Carson blandly declined to give a room rent-free or let one to the government on credit. But when Curry heard of the difficulty, he came forward solitary and alone and shouldered the ship of state over the bar and got her afloat again. I refer to Curry, old Curry, old Abe Curry. But for him, the legislature would have been obliged to sit in the desert. He offered his large stone building just outside the capital limits rent-free and it was gladly accepted. Then he built a horse railroad from town to the capital and carried the legislators gratis. He also furnished pine benches and chairs for the legislature and covered the floors with clean sawdust by way of carpet and spittoon combined. But for Curry, the government would have died in its tender infancy. A canvas partition to separate the Senate from the House of Representatives was put up by the Secretary at a cost of $3.40, but the United States declined to pay for it. Upon being reminded that the instructions permitted the payment of a liberal rent for a legislative hall, and that that money was saved to the country by Mr. Curry's generosity, the United States said that did not alter the matter, and the three dollars and forty cents would be subtracted from the secretary's eighteen hundred dollar salary, and it was. The matter of printing was from the beginning an interesting feature of the new government's difficulties. The secretary was sworn to obey his volume of written instructions, and these commanded him to do two certain things without fail. These, one. Get the House and Senate journals printed, and two, for this work pay one dollar and fifty cents per thousand for composition and one dollar and fifty cents per token for press work and greenbacks. It was easy to swear to do these two things, but it was entirely impossible to do more than one of them. When greenbacks had gone down to forty cents on the dollar, the prices regularly charged everybody by printing establishments were $1.50 per thousand and $1.50 per token in gold. The instructions commanded that the secretary regard a paper dollar issued by the government as equal to any other dollar issued by the government. Hence, the printing of the journals was discontinued. Then the United States sternly rebuked the secretary for disregarding the instructions and warned him to correct his ways. Wherefore, he got some printing done, forwarded the bill to Washington with full exhibits of the high prices of things in the territory, and called attention to a printed market report wherein it would be observed that even hay was $250 a ton. The United States responded by subtracting the printing bill from the Secretary's suffering salary, and, moreover, remarked with dense gravity that he would find nothing in his instructions requiring him to purchase hay. Nothing in this world is palled in such impenetrable obscurity as a U.S. Treasury Comptroller's understanding. The very fires of the hereafter could get up nothing more than a fitful glimmer in it. In the days I speak of, he never could be made to comprehend why it was that $20,000 would not go as far in Nevada, where all commodities ranged at an enormous figure, as it would in the other territories, where exceeding cheapness was the rule. He was an officer who looked out for the little expenses all the time. The Secretary of the Territory kept his office in his bedroom, as I before remarked, and he charged the United States no rent 
although his instructions provided for that item and he could have justly taken advantage of it. A thing which I would have done with more than lightning promptness if I had been secretary myself. But the United States never applauded this devotion. Indeed, I think my country was ashamed to have so improvident a person in its employ. Those instructions, we used to read a chapter from them every morning as intellectual gymnastics, and a couple of chapters in Sunday school every Sabbath, for they treated of all subjects under the sun and had much valuable religious matter in them, along with the other statistics. Those instructions commanded that pen knives, envelopes, pens, and writing paper be furnished the members of the legislature. So the secretary made the purchase and the distribution. The knives cost three dollars apiece. There was one too many, and the secretary gave it to the clerk of the House of Representatives. The United States said the clerk of the House was not a member of the legislature and took that three dollars out of the secretary's salary, as usual. White men charged three or four dollars a load for sawing up stove wood. The secretary was sagacious enough to know that the United States would never pay any such price as that, so he got an Indian to saw up a load of office wood at one dollar and a half. He made out the usual voucher, but signed no name to it, simply appended a note explaining that an Indian had done the work and had done it in a very capable and satisfactory way, but could not sign the voucher owing to lack of ability and the necessary direction. The secretary had to pay that dollar and a half. He thought the United States would admire both his economy and his honesty in getting the work done at half price and not putting a pretended Indian signature to the voucher. But the United States did not see it in that light. The United States was too much accustomed to employing dollar-and-a-half thieves in all manner of official capacities to regard his explanation of the voucher as having any foundation in fact. But the next time the Indian was sawed wood for us, I taught him to make a cross at the bottom of the voucher. It looked like a cross that had been drunk a year. And then I witnessed it, and it went through all right. The United States never said a word. I was sorry I had not made the voucher for a thousand loads of wood instead of one. The government of my country snubs honest simplicity, but fondless artistic villainy, but fondles artistic villainy, and I think I might have developed into a very capable pickpocket if I had remained in the public service a year or two. That was a fine collection of sovereigns at first Nevada legislature. They levied taxes to the amount of thirty or forty thousand dollars and ordered expenditures to the extent of about a million. Yet they had their little periodical explosions of economy like all other bodies of the kind. A member proposed to save three dollars a day to the nation by dispensing with the chaplain. And yet that short-sighted man needed the chaplain more than any other member, perhaps, for he generally sat with his feet on his desk, eating raw turnips during the morning prayer. The legislature sat sixty days and passed private toll road franchises all the time. When they adjourned, it was estimated that every citizen owned about three franchises, and it was believed that unless Congress gave the territory another degree of longitude, there would not be room enough to accommodate the toll roads. The ends of them were hanging over the boundary line everywhere like a fringe. The fact is, the freighting business had grown to such important proportions that there was nearly as much excitement over suddenly acquired toll road fortunes as over the wonderful silver mines.